Good morning and welcome back. We are in fellowship. We are talking about fellowship and I want us to discuss it to the point that it really sinks deep into our heart, that we understand that fellowship is an imperative. It's not just a great idea. It's not just a purpose that God has for the church, but it is an imperative. And why would God command fellowship? We want to understand that. And it being our fellowship fortnight, we are thinking and talking about all of this so that it sinks into our hearts and we develop a conviction about it. Me, from my heart to yours, we want a conviction about fellowship. I don't come to fellowship because I love uh, the food or I love the people, particularly who come to my church or to my youth group or to my home group. I come to fellowship out of an obedience to God. And that's when we understand what a mandate is or what a, or an imperative is. So I want us to understand it in such a way that I can actually explain it to somebody else. Right. I want you to I want you to be able to explain it to somebody else. How do you explain to others the importance of fellowship? What would you say? What reasons would you give? How would you explain it so that it would become a conviction, not just a culture, not just something you grew up with, not just something your family was particular about, but because God's word says it, that it's a conviction. So let me begin by taking you to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 onwards. The real verse is 24, 25, whenever we talk about fellowship. But I don't want you to get lost with the many words, but you do need to look at the context. So uh, this is a beautiful passage, beautiful, beautiful passage in the book of Hebrews in the Bible. Let me read it for you. It's on your screen. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and the living way that he opened for us through the curtain, the veil that was torn from top to bottom when the, when the Lord Jesus died. The veil now that is through his flesh because of him, because of what he has done for us, that veil between us and God has been torn open. We can come boldly into his presence. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, that's Jesus. So he begins to say, because we have that, because we, we know this, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Our hearts sprinkled clean from, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Last week, I remember telling you about how the Lord Jesus uh, cleanses us with his blood, even uh, our very conscience itself. I was praying for you during our communion time and we were talking about that. Heart sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. You see that word on your screen? And our bodies washed with pure water. So the first let us is, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance. That's the, that's the approach. That's the way in which we come to God, right? The second let us is in verse 23. He says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Because that is what God has given to us. We don't have a faith. We have a hope. Our faith is in Jesus, but our hope is in heaven. So let us hold fast, to the hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. Why would I waver? What, what would shake me? Well, we'll talk about that in just a bit. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. For he who promised is faithful. Then we get to verse 24 that talks about fellowship. He says, let us consider, think about, how to stir up one another. In fact, the original uh, word is how do we uh, kick each other? You know, how do we, uh, you know, provoke one another? Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. To love and good works. What is love? At the essence in its rawest form, love is forgiveness. To be loving towards somebody is to be able to forgive someone. So let us consider how we can stir one another up to be able to forgive one another. Wow. Stir one another up so that people have authentic relationships, long lasting relationships, because they have the capacity and the endurance, the stamina to keep forgiving. And the second thing he says is good works. Stir one another up to love and good works. What is good works? Good works is God's works. For only God is good. Your good works and my goods, good works are like filthy rags. So let's not talk about that. 
Your good works and my good works don't stand anywhere in the measure of God. So let's not talk about in the economy of God. So let's not talk about that. Let's talk about God's works. What is God doing? And Jesus said, greater works will you do when I am with the Father. Right? Remember that? So good works is God working in me and love is me forgiving people. So let us stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as some are in the habit of doing, but please circle this, encouraging one another. I want to park here for a little while. Encouraging one another, all the more as you see the day drawing near. So with every passing day, as you get closer and closer to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, are there earthquakes happening? Yes. Natural disasters happening? Globally. Marriages happening? Lots. Uh, uh, buildings and construction, my goodness. Every sign, every sign and, 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 and clue that these are the last days is, is happening right now. And we are living in the last days. And as you see this, as you watch the news, we need to become even more keen and more passionate about stirring one another up to love and good deeds. So we've got three over here. You got let us draw near with a true heart. That's our approach. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith. That's about holding our faith together, holding strong. Then he says, let's not give up meeting together. Let's come together as is our, as, as is our custom, as is our, as our discipline, our habit, and let us encourage one another. Let us encourage one another. Note on your, on your screens, note in the verse, it says, let us. Nowhere is the Christian focus on the individual. After you get saved, when you give your life to Jesus on a personal level, you come to God, you, you, you repent for your own sin and you come to Jesus. Jesus, the Holy Spirit puts you in Jesus and Jesus puts you in his body. Jesus puts you in his, in his community. Jesus puts you in his people and he makes you one with them. And from then on, your identity, your work and your ministry is in us. It's the us. So we grow together, we live together, we, uh, we, we work together, and we hope together. Let us, even the entering into God's presence, he says, we enter. You see that? We enter. Let me take you to another passage of scripture just to make a ground here, to, to uh, make a foundation here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 onwards. It's for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a great command. Here's Thessalonians, Paul teaching the Thessalonica church on the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with a voice of an archangel, and with the trump of the sound, uh, sound of the trumpet of God. And de the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's what's going to happen before this. Then verse 17 says, then we who are alive and who are left will be caught up together with him. We who are alive and are left will be caught up together with him uh, in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. There's going to be a midair meeting with the Lord Jesus as he comes to take his bride. This is called the rapture. This is called the, the coming of Christ for his bride. And he comes, there will be trumpet sound and we will hear the trumpet and we'll be caught up together and we will meet with him. And so we will always be with the Lord. Hallelujah. So we will always be with the Lord. And then what does he say? He says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. So we encourage one another to turn to Jesus. We encourage one another to stay in Christ. We encourage one another to love, that is to forgive. We encourage one another to do the good works, that is God working in us. And we encourage one another to be prepared for the Lord Jesus is coming. Brother, sister, the direction you're going in is not good. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your faith. You're wasting your strength. You're wasting your 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 uh, your gifts and talents. Come on, serve the Lord. Come get involved. Come stay with us. Don't 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 uh, waver. Don't don't go astray. Fellowship is a command because it keeps us together. And he says, encourage one another with these words. Verse twenty four of Hebrews chapter ten says, but encouraging one another. Let's talk about that for just a minute. The word encourage, it's a Christian word. The word encourage is not to compliment or to make somebody feel good about themselves. The word encourage means to pour courage into the inner man, to be able to speak courage into somebody. And only somebody, somebody who has the courage that God gives can pour courage into others. Only someone who has the word of God, the promise of God, the truth of God can pour courage. So this is very Christian. This is the this is the rights 
This is the advantage. This is the prerogative of believers. Those who have the Holy Spirit, those who have the inner man for the joy of the Lord is my strength. Encouragement is what believers do for one another. When you gather in larger groups, we sit in rows and we look forward. We listen to those scriptures and at best I, the preacher, encourage you with God's word. But when do you, the members, encourage one another? When do you pour into each other's lives? When do you hold each other's hands and say, we're going to get through this. Everything's going to be all right. When do you look into each other's eyes and say, you're far from God, but you can come back to God and there is forgiveness. When do you and I hold each other's hands or when do you and I carry one another through the difficult times in our life or break out a hole in the roof and let one down in front of the Lord that he may heal them? Encouragement. Encouragement versus inspiration. Encouragement versus inspiration. There's a lot of inspiration today. Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp. You keep sending me lots and lots of pictures and you are hoping that I'll be inspired. Early in the morning, late at night, in the middle of the day, anything that inspires you, you believe will inspire me, so you pass it on. This is inspiration. Inspiration is lovely. Inspiration is great. Inspiration helps me from the outside in. Inspiration moves me to, uh, to be happy about things, about situations. Inspiration tells me that God is at active all around me. Inspiration, however, doesn't get me through a hard day. Inspiration doesn't last long. Inspiration uh, runs out. If I hear an inspiring message, I have to hear one again and again and again. And church and ministries today, preachers and stages today, ministries and videos today are wrapped around and built around inspiration. The great one-liners, the fantastic build-up and the crescendo and the music. Oh, you feel built up. Oh, you feel excited. My brothers and sisters, that's inspiration. But when the perspiration hits, what you really need is encouragement. When you go through a difficult time or when you're alone at night, you can't go to YouTube or podcast for another inspirational message. You can only listen to so many. You'll feel all fizzed up, but you will not be able to be carried through your situation. The believer is called to encourage one another. The preacher is called to encourage the church. The husband is called to encourage the wife. The parents are called to encourage the children. What is the difference between inspiration and encouragement? See, large gatherings, they become stage focused, not just by way of seat seating, but everything in the large gathering program becomes about what's happening on stage. Large gatherings sit in rows, so they turn their back to the bulk of the audience. Large gatherings require energy. If you have 200 people, 500 people, you need to have an energy on the stage. So the drums and the bassist become very important to us. Or the pastor has to yell. Large gatherings require energy and entertainment. Large gatherings look for inspiration and look for sensation. So you want to fill that hall and you want to say, that was powerful, that was moving, that was it. And then you say the most blasphemous words at the end of a service and you say, I felt the presence of God. You say, God was there. He was always there. Even when you were not there, he was there. When you didn't attend church, he was also there. So don't, feeling inspired is not the presence of God. Feeling encouraged is knowing the presence of God. Large gatherings are stage focus. They sit in rows. They require energy. They require entertainment. Everything has got to be focused on, 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 on class and on, on performance. Inspiration, sensation. Let's talk about small groups, small churches. Small fellowships, small fellowships, they require, uh, they, they, they're relationship focused. Small fellowships are relationship focused. They're about each other. There is no stage, there's no pre preacher, there's no entertainment, there's no show. Small groups sit in circles face to face. You can't avoid each other. Small groups require conversation and engagement. Small groups require conversation and engagement. Small groups look for empathy and support. 
When you go to a large gathering, you're looking for uh, you're looking for inspiration and sensation. But when you go to a small group, you're looking for empathy and you're looking for support. Is it any wonder God has called us to meet in smaller groups? He's formed the family as the first unit of the church. He's formed uh, small groups in homes all over the uh, all over the place. Acts twenty twenty talks about people in the first century church meeting in homes. Did they meet on the weekend in large gatherings? Yes, they did, because Paul had to preach. Paul had to give the big message to everybody. So they, they did meet in big groups, but once a week. But every day they met in homes. Now, if you're not going to meet every day and you're only going to meet once a week, I'd rather you met in a home. I'd rather it was a, about empathy and support. I'd rather you saw face to face. I'd rather you engaged with one another. I'd rather you encouraged one another. Encouragement versus inspiration. Both have a role. But encouragement is spiritual. Let me take you to Ephesians chapter 4. Again, a lot of words, but I want you to uh, focus in on a few here. And he gave the apostles, the prophets and evangelists. That is, God gave, Jesus gave to the church gifts. These gifts are people. These people are roles. These are not titles. These are not titles. These are roles. These are appointed, spiritually anointed roles. He gave apostles, he gave prophets, he gave evangelists, and he gave shepherd teachers. He gave pastor teachers. What, is, what are they called to do? What is their job? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That means it's the saints, it's the people of God who are going to do the ministry. Where are they going to do the ministry? In small groups, in home groups, in home churches, in, in house fellowships. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Now we're going to talk about maturity here. We're going to talk about discipleship for building up on the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity, until we all attain, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, until we all attain to the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to, oh, you've got to underline this, to mature manhood. It's not called masculinity, it's mature manhood is complete, mankind, complete manhood. To mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness. Oh my goodness, look at these words. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We're talking about growing up. We're talking about maturity. We're talking about discipleship into Jesus. We're talking about becoming more and more like Christ as an individual, more and more like Christ as a body. Why? So that, verse 14, look at it. So that. We may no longer be children. What is the opposite of mature? Childlike. What is the opposite of grown up? Not grown up. Childlike. So that we may no longer be children. Now what are children like? Tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, every new fad, every new heresy, every new cult, anyone comes up with a bright idea, a more challenging way of looking at truth, a more uh, exciting way of redefining the gospel, and everybody wants to go and listen to them. Those are children, immature, immature children who can't pick a lie when they see it, who can't point out a lie when they see it. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and by craftiness in deceitful schemes. If I was doing an exposition, I'd get deep into each of those, but I'm not. Here we are, verse 4, 15. Rather, speaking the truth in love, speaking the truth in love, that means tough love. That means telling the truth, but saying it lovingly. Telling the truth, but saying it lovingly. You can be right and rude. And that makes you wrong. You can be unloving and truthful and that makes you ineffective. Speaking the truth in love. We are to, watch this, grow up in every way into him. We are to grow up. You tell me that's going to happen on a Sunday morning. Are you telling me that's going to happen from listening to sermons, sitting in rows, what coming to church once in, once in a week, some of you, some of you once, in, once in a month? You think, you think that maturity is just going to happen sitting and listening to lectures? This is not the Indian education system. This is Jesus growing his people with the gifts of he, he gives to the church. 
so that you may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by winds of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, how are you going to grow up? You're going to speak the truth in love. That means tell people what's really going on in their lives. Have the guts, have the audacity to tell people the truth. They're being lied to by the world. They've been lied to by everybody. Tell them the truth. We are to grow up into in every way into him. Who is him? The body, the head of the head. Sorry, he, who is him? He is the head. He is Christ. He is the head of the church from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When everybody is doing his own thing, when everybody is doing his own part, each part working properly makes the body grow up so that it builds itself up in love. What are we saying here? Keywords, attain, mature, measure. Why? So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro. What does a mature person look like? A mature person is loving. A mature person is able to tell the truth but in love. A mature person is able to uh, identify heresies and be able to knock out lies. A mature person is going to be able to tell the difference between differentiate between what's of God and what is not of God. Obedience and disobedience so that you may be mature. What's my point? Discipleship or disciples are made in community. Disciples are made in a community. It takes a group. It takes a fellowship to grow the church. One person will encourage. Another person will tell the truth in love. Another person will exemplify. Another person will support. Another person will just stand by quietly. Another person will pray. And everybody plays their role as each one does its part. The end result when everyone does its part is maturity. Why are churches immature today? Because everyone is not doing their part. Why is the church immature today? Why is it divided today? Why is there sectarianism in the church today? Because everyone is looking at the stage. Everyone is looking at one person. Everyone is listening to one sermon. When we get into groups, when we are in fellowships, when we are telling each other the truth, when we have the guts to call the world out of a believer, to call the world out of a believer, and to say, that's worldly, that's not Jesus-like, that's not Christ-like. And when the believer has the humility to say, you know what, if anyone should tell me the truth, it's got to be believers. And they repent and they get right. Can you imagine the power of our community? Can you imagine the impact of our discipleship and of our witness if we were a church that told each other the truth, accepted the truth from one another and lived accordingly. We would become mature. And when we become mature, we'd be grown up into the full stature of the Lord Jesus. And when we become mature and are grown up, then we're not going to fall for every stupid lie, for every besetting lie, for every cunning scheme. Disciples are made in community. So God mandates fellowship because fellowship provides a climate for growth. Fellowship sets the temperature for devotion. When you come into the fellowship of believers, you can walk into a big concert. Uh, you don't become as you don't, you don't become as good as the best musician in the on the stage. You don't become anything like somebody who's on the stage. <laughs> but when you get into a group of friends, oh boy! First year college, second year college, by third year college, you all look the same, sound the same, smell the same, dress the same. Tell me why. Tell me why. Because a group will always reach the same level of who they are, what they like and what they want to be. If you didn't like it, you would have left the group. God created that for good works. Being in fellowship, being in a community, it provides a climate for growth, but it also sets the temperature for devotion. In social circles, it's as exciting as the party animal in the group. In spiritual circles, it's as passionate and devotion, devoted as the most spiritual person in the group. And you are always moving upwards because the Holy Spirit is moving everybody to be as hot and as excited and as passionate as the most excited person in the group. People carry one another and they excite one another about the things of God. Are you not on fire for the Lord? 
Is your heart cold? Are you, do you feel far from the Lord? Do you not feel excited about spiritual things? Because you haven't been with people who are excited about spiritual things. You haven't hung out with people who are on fire for the Lord. Your closest friends are far from God. You need fellowship. You need to be in fellowship and you need to learn what fellowship does, what role fellowship plays in your faith. It provides a climate for growth. It sets the temperature for devotion. It maintains a standard of maturity. It may you, they won't allow you to remain immature. They will speak the truth in love. Iron sharpens iron, yes? And then it protects the member from straying. Disciples are made in a community. In a fellowship, it protects the members from strain. You can miss Sunday morning church and no one will notice for two to three weeks. But you miss dinner and your empty chair is right there. You miss fellowship group and they know you're not there. And that, my brother and sister, is a good thing. That's a good thing. You may not like it when you're trying to run from God, but you'll be glad that there's a group of people praying for you, reaching out to you and trying to get you back. Disciples are made in community. Let's land this plane. Come on, let me give you a couple more verses here. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. I just mentioned it. Iron sharpens iron. Uh, and like iron sharpens iron, a man sharpens another. Uh, this is a very loose version, but the, the original, the King James, which I learned was, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. That's his face. That's his face. That's one man telling another man, if you're happy and you know it, tell your face. That's one man telling another man, there's something wrong. I can read your face. There's something wrong. What's going on, buddy? And that happens face to face. Fellowship. That happens when you can see the expressions on, other, on others' faces. That happens when you see a coldness or, an, or, or, a, or a despair or something and you read it and you say, brother, what is going on? Tell me. Acts chapter 17 verse 11 says, And now these Jews who were more noble than those in Thessalonica, they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were true. Another version says searching the scriptures. My brothers and sisters, when you come to a big gathering and I'm preaching, you barely bring your Bible. Uh, you don't bring notes. You don't bring it. Sometimes I provide you with notes. And you pretty much stay on my page. You stay on the notes. You stay in that paragraph, right? And that's okay because it's a large gathering. How much can you possibly do? Can you speak out? No, you'll be really weird if you spoke out in the middle of a big gathering. But in a small group, you can search the scriptures. The first century church people, they gathered in homes and they searched the scriptures. Hmm, what would you search the, search the scriptures for? Let me give you three ideas. Number one, life. What's marriage all about? What's singlehood all about? What's uh, family life all about? What's work and, and the Christian faith all about? Life matters. You'll search the scriptures and you'll turn to somebody else in the group and you say, hey, wh where does the Bible say about that? Or what does the Bible say about this? Or uh, isn't this wrong? Some, I just feel that, you know, and, and people will search the scriptures for the truth. If a wrong uh, a teaching comes along, if a heresy comes along, you'll search the scriptures to see if what he's saying is true. If you don't open your Bible, if you don't search the scriptures, you're not going to know if the fellow speaking on, on podcasts or on TV or whatever is telling the truth or not. But the Berean believers, where Paul went to speak, he says they not only received the, script, the, the word, that's great, that's like the Thessalonian believers. He's telling the Thessalonians, he says, they not only received the, uh, the, the word, but in fact they went back to the Bible and said, um... That was a great point he made, but mm, where I, I don't where did he say that? Where where does he where is it in the word? So it's not the preacher that's the authority in the in the believer's life. It's not the pastor that's the authority in the believer's life. It's not the doctrinal faith or the custom or the tradition that's the authority. It's the scriptures that are the authority. You go back to the scriptures and you say, I believe it because here I found it. I believe it because it's right here. You with me? Are you with me? When you search the scriptures, you will find answers because Jesus says, when you search me with all your heart, you will be found by me. 
in the volume of the book it is written of me. That's the old King James Version to say, I am there in all the scriptures. He turned to the Jews, he turned to the Pharisees and says, you guys are hypocrites. If you really studied the scriptures, if you really searched the scriptures, you would have found me. Because from Genesis to, Exodus, to, to Revelation, I am there. I'm all over the scripture. The whole thing is really about me. You'll see Jesus in the Old Testament. You'll see Jesus in the New Testament. So we'll, if you search the scriptures, you'll find life matters. If you search the scriptures, you'll find truth. You'll find the person of truth and you'll find the deity of truth. If you search the scriptures, you'll find your identity, who you are, because the scripture is like a mirror. It'll tell you who you are. It'll remind you who you are. It'll remind you whose you are. It'll remind you where you belong. It'll remind you where you're going. Huh. You can't do that when you come to a big gathering and sit in pews. You've got to go home. You've got to get in a group and you've got to open the scriptures and say, talk to me. Talk to me. What do you say? What do you think? You, when's the last time you've been in a Bible study where you actually talked? We love two things. We love hearing lectures and we love rotofine. We just want to know the answer. Just tell me what the answer is. And tell me if there is an answer, tell me what the answer is. So we want rote answers and we want long lectures and we want minimal engagement. That's got to change. That's got to change because the bulk of your exposition, the bulk of truth finding, the bulk of your research, the bulk of revelation is going to, is, is, needs to come from y'all opening the Bible and teaching one another. Teaching one another. When you search the scriptures, you'll find Jesus. And you'll find yourself and you'll find purpose that's not going to happen in a big group it happens in fellowship together when you pray together and when you study the word together so don't get don't let one person speak forever and don't come just hoping to take notes come prepared to ask questions and keep asking until you find the answer have you ever noticed that fellowship is an imperative? It's an imperative. It's a command. Now, why would God command you for fellowship? I'll tell you why. And I'll close with this. It's because Christian fellowship is not a carnal appetite. It's not a physical appetite. Christian fellowship is not a desire that's going to come from the flesh. So when I'm hungry... You don't have to tell me to eat. I will get irritated. I will go find food. I will, I will find food. I'll eat. When I'm tired, I will stop listening to you and I'll go to sleep. Like some of you have right now. My body tells me what it wants. And I say, yes, sir. No, sir. Three bags full, sir. And that is why you don't run towards fellowship. Because it is not a physical appetite. The flesh doesn't demand it. Fellowship is a spiritual appetite. The spirit demands it. And the spirit is only as strong as it is fed. It develops when it is being fed. It grows from consistency. It results in maturity. You have to get to a place where your spirit starts demanding from you time, attention, and people so that your spiritual needs are met. And that's not even going to get started until you go to the people who have a spiritual appetite. Christian fellowship is not a carnal appetite, so you're not going to feel it. And for those of you waiting to feel it, waiting for a time when you will feel like going to home group, feel like going to house church, feel like going to Bible study, feel like getting on a WhatsApp group and praying with us, it's never going to happen. You're never going to feel it. And if you feel it, congratulations, it's not coming back. You need to make it a discipline. You need to understand that you need to feed the spirit. And once you feed the spirit, then the appetite will come. So the effort that it's going to take 
It's not always going to be. You need to put in the effort. But once your, your spirit is alive, once your spirit is working, once your spirit is doing the work of God, once your spirit is being used by God, you will get spiritually hungry and then you'll go after it. My brothers and sisters, you have understood what I have said today. The question is, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to change in your life? What priorities are you going to re readjust? And what are you going to explain to others? When you think about fellowship, I started by asking, saying two simple things. I said, I want you to understand how to explain this. And I want you to understand that this is a conviction. You need to have a conviction about fellowship. Otherwise, it's not going to work. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Let me pray for you to make a decision. Let me pray for you to come to a conclusion about this matter. And then do something about it. Please, work with me on this. I am dedicated to your spiritual maturity. Will you partner with me in your growth? Father in heaven, thank you so much for this morning, for what we have learned. Thank you for the truths of scripture that have led us, fed us, taught us. Thank you, O oh God, that we don't have to do this on our own, that we have the, help, the, wealth, the, the, the support of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to do this on our own. We have the word of God in our language. We don't have to do this on our own. We have people you have given to us to grow with. So we've got a body of people. We've got the word in our language. We've got the Holy Spirit living in us. We've got the cross behind us. And we've got a crown in front of us. We have every good reason to obey. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each and every one of us through this week and even forevermore. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Remember that the best small group is the Trinity itself. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are a small group. And they think it's a great idea. God bless you.